Hello and welcome to the OSHA ETS update webinar that we have put together. My name is Holly Foxworth. I am a registered nurse and the webinar host and then also the uh, marketing manager for content here at Axiom. And I am thrilled to have Chuck on here today to kind of talk us through what is going on this week with, with some of the changes that have occurred with OSHA. So I realize there's been a lot of questions that have been come up and you guys are confused. I, I totally get it. I think that there's a lot, um, a lot of different places here where information is kind of getting lost um, between some of the um, the votes that are taking place and what those expectations of employers are supposed to be. So I am excited to have Chuck. And, and for those of you, I'm sure you already know Chuck, but anyways, if you haven't met him before, he is our chief legal and HR officer here at Axiom, and he is a genius. He really has a true gift for taking complex um, um, information and really simplifying it into terms and, and in ways that we can all understand a little bit easier. So uh, before I turn things over to um, to Chuck to get started, I just want to mention several things. The first being that um, this is a modified event. We put this on last minute, so it is a little bit shorter than what we normally have. Uh, but please don't, don't refrain from sending your questions. We will get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so if you'll just type in your question there in the Q&A box, we'll make for sure that we get to that. If for some reason we don't make it to your specific question, we definitely will follow up with you individually. Make sure you get the information that you're needing. The other is that there are, you'll notice there on your console, there's free resources that are listed there at the bottom. And so there's everything from white papers to guides, et cetera. And then we always get a lot of questions about, um, about what it is on solutions, et cetera. So if there's, if you'd like to get scheduled for a demo that goes through the vaccine Vault and the testing vault, et cetera. There is a, um, a, a, I believe it's an image that we have there, but it's on the left lower hand side, and it, that would give you the, the information to get one of those demos scheduled. So the last thing I'll mention, then we'll call it, I'll give it over completely, is that we are going to be starting a new webinar series that's going to be on December the 2nd, and it's called uh, New Days, New Ways for uh, Managing Employee Health in 2022. And so the first part of this will actually, is going to have uh, Dr. Kristen Dixon, and so she's going to talk us through some of the options that are available for diagnostics and imaging so you get the same type of information much lower price and, and some different options there so if you haven't already uh, you will see information that will come out about that at the end of the broadcast there will also be a screen that pops up and it'll give you an opportunity to register for that there so at this point I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you Chuck for all things OSHA ETS and we will take the questions if you're done Thanks, Holly. Um, so just real quick, everybody, as, as Holly said, so I'm, my name's Chuck Cable. I'm in charge of legal, human resources, uh, talent development, recruiting, a bunch of fun stuff. Um, been a lawyer for just over 20 years um, and have spent the better part of the past two years, you know, kind of really digging in on understanding how OSHA is considering the risk presented by COVID. So here we are. Um, let's, let's talk through the situational dynamic we find ourselves in. So the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, which is essentially encompasses the states of uh, Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, um, came out with this stay, right? There were these petitioners that came in and said, we want you court to order that OSHA not begin any enforcement activity on this because we think that there are a whole, whole bunch of things wrong with it, okay? The Fifth Circuit is probably the most conservative uh, district um, in the country right now. Um, followed not too, not, not too far away from them is the Sixth Circuit, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the Fifth Circuit determined that there was a rational basis to allow a temporary restraining order or a stay um, pending further review, right? And so the further review happened, and on November 12th, there was an order issued by the Fifth Circuit uh, indicating that OSHA was to not take any additional enforcement activity because there are these, you know, grave issues that they identified uh, in the order, which we have and can make available if anybody wants it. It's riveting reading. Um, now, contextually leading up to this, because there are so many kind of cases that are pending in the federal courts regarding the ETS, um, there is a process that is followed for multi-district litigation where everything gets consolidated into one court, and there is a random lottery where they determine one federal circuit to handle all the cases that are filed relating to that matter, in this case, OSHA's ETS. And so the Sixth Circuit, as we know now, was selected in that lottery to handle 
these cases moving forward. Backing up a minute, what is a stay? A stay is not a determination of the merits of the ETS itself, okay? A stay is a technical procedural tool to prevent something from happening. It's, it's an injunction essentially saying, stop, don't do anything else. There's a fight to be had here, okay? So bear that in mind. That's relevant because everything that happens from this point forward is going to be addressing the stay. It is not going to be addressing the merits of the case, which we expect to ferret itself out through the multi-district litigation in the Sixth Circuit over the next, pick a number, six months, 12 months, I don't know, we'll see, okay? So it's important to understand that a stay is not a decision on the merits of the case. A stay is simply this mechanism where you have to show likelihood of success, irreparable harm, all these kind of fancy legal words in order for a court to say, okay, we're gonna let this pause essentially. So everything that's happening now is going to be used to challenge the pause and say, we don't wanna push pause. The government's gonna say, we wanna push the play button, not the pause button. Pause button should never have been pressed, right? That's their position. And so that's what's going to be ferreted out in courts, I think reasonably quickly, okay? So that leads me to kind of next steps where we think this is gonna go. So. The Department of Labor, on behalf of OSHA, will be submitting a motion to reconsider uh, and or remove the stay with the Sixth Circuit, the new circuit, okay? That motion should be filed the next week, week to two weeks, call it, probably very soon. The Sixth Circuit will then hear that motion, make a decision. So what could happen is they'll say, government, we agree with you. We're going we're gonna to pull the stay back allow OSHA to move forward with enforcement, and then we're gonna litigate all these cases, you know, and all the, all the issues that came, came with them moving forward, okay? Now that, wh whatever happens, okay, is gonna go to the Supreme Court on this, make no mistake, okay? It will, it's just, people will exhaust their remedies, right? That's what's gonna happen here. So you're gonna have the motion filed, the decision's gonna be had, there's gonna be a petition for certiorari at the Supreme Court, and you know, emergency petition, um, and then uh, we're, we're thinking that a decision on a stay will be reached not before the first compliance deadline in December, highly unlikely, right? December 4th, I think was that date. But it is highly likely that all this gets ferreted out before the second enforcement date, the testing enforcement date in January, January 6th, I think. Clear as mud, right? What does that mean for you? <laughs> How do you prepare? You know, how do you think about this? I, look, I think obviously people are confused, concerned. They don't know what to do. I think that that every bit of editorial that I've read on this from kind of what I would call rational sources, so meaning kind of other attorneys and law firms that are commenting, everyone's saying, look, this is up in the air. It's going to move forward through this process. However, a prudent employer will take steps to prepare, okay? What that means is thinking about the lay of the land where you have applicability, right? So if you're primar primarily a remote workforce, the standard itself says it doesn't apply to those folks, which is good news, you know, from a cost perspective, you know, but again, if you're in this position of kind of hybrid where you've got people working from home that rotate through offices or you've got meetings or conferences or whatever, it's addressing your current protocol for managing that because everybody's got some kind of a protocol over 100 employees right we're managing the risk here and comparing it to what the standard would be assuming the ets is effective okay identify gaps identify how you're going to address those gaps assuming that this thing does become effective in january okay i think there may be a little bit of grace given from osha in terms of aggressiveness of enforceability um, you know, given this kind of, you know, gray that we find ourselves in, but do not draw any inferences from OSHA's announcement there that they're suspending enforcement. They have to because a federal, a federal court said they had to, right? That's procedural. They're not going to violate, a federal government agency is not going to violate a federal court's order, okay? It's, it's just not going to happen. They have to respect the process, and that's, that's what's happening now. We're running the process, okay? So don't be surprised okay, that this that it's happening this way. A lot of people are like, oh, what does this mean? It means nothing. I mean, this is exactly what's supposed to happen given the way the court ordered. 
there there was some discussion around whether the court would order the Fifth Circuit would would you know kind of comment on this before the lottery to assign the sixth, and of course they did, right? Because they get to control the narrative, or they get to control the talking points around the narrative that is now going to move forward. Which, if you're from a very conservative district with a very specific view on COVID, that's exactly what what happened. Here. Now, I, I hear a lot of people kind of talking about the relative conservatism or perception of conservatism in the Sixth Circuit. Look, judges are supposed to be impartial, period. We'll see how this plays out, right? I think that um, one thing that is relevant that I did comment on on LinkedIn, if you follow me, is you know, the situational dynamic that these judges have found themselves in it is materially different from the Sixth Circuit compared to the Fifth Circuit, I think, okay? Yeah. The only reason I, I speak with some knowledge on the Sixth Circuit is I'm originally from Michigan. I have family in Michigan. We regularly hear about what's happening there, and that is a, a part of the Sixth Circuit. It's Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So we, we hear about the way COVID has impacted that state, um, right? And so the, the dynamic and the impact of the disease that's felt by that population, I think is a little bit different than the way it was felt in Texas, for example, which is where I live now, a um, little bit different. So that's not to say that impartiality is here, neither here nor there in terms of, of how this stuff impacts us, but just bear that in mind, like we can't, we don't know what's gonna happen, right? We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what this court's going to say. Again, which is all the more reason to kind of take that step back and perform that gap analysis. Where are we now? Where do we need to be? What steps have to happen to get us there? And if there's anything that can be done to address gaps with kind of minimal impact on the cost side now, do it. Get ready, right? Because, you know, luck favors the prepared, right? So if you're one of these businesses that doesn't know what to do, that's my advice. Address the gaps, understand how you're going to mitigate the gaps if and when this becomes effective, okay? If you're a business that's saying we're not doing a darn thing until we know what's happening, just know that take that risk eyes wide open is my advice to you, okay? Take that risk eyes wide open. It's what I always say kind of in these, we always, it always comes down to risk appetite and risk tolerance. If you're a business that's got a high appetite for risk and a high tolerance for risk, that's your prerogative. But make those decisions with the best information available and your eyes wide open, right? That's the way to think about this, I think, given what we know today. Now, if anybody wants my personal opinion, this is my personal opinion, disassociated. I am not speaking on behalf of Axiom at the moment. I've read the briefs. My personal opinion, again, is that the arguments presented by the government are strong and rational. The arguments presented by the petitioners and indeed that were reflected in the court's order in my opinion, were based in part on anecdotal evidence that we've heard essentially since the pandemic began. And I think there was a, a bit of a, uh, a glossing over of some of the provisions that OSHA, OSHA did include to accommodate, for example, folks that work from home or work outside, okay? And that's all I'm gonna say about that. That doesn't mean anything, okay? That's my personal view based on the steps that I took to prepare myself to understand what was going to happen. All that means there will be three times as many people that disagree with me, I'm sure, okay? And that that's fine. But the point is, you know, if you've got attorneys that are able to help you digest, review, understand, now would be kind of a good time to maybe talk to them a little bit, spend a little bit of money if they're outside, if they're inside, good for you for having an inside counsel, talk to them a little bit about it and get their opinions after they've reviewed this stuff just to get a lay of the land because the, it's, it's kind of a weighted probability analysis right now. And so you guys need to make that decision ultimately on your own, right? But, but regardless, <laughs> gap analysis, prepare to move so that when we know what the result is, you can take that gap analysis and put it in your back pocket if, if you know, the standard goes away, you know, which is, unlikely in my opinion um but if it goes away you've got it you did the work you know where there were some gaps and maybe you can use it future facing to help mitigate the impact of other disease down the road i don't know okay we'll see what happens but um 
That's that's the lay of the land as we sit here today. If, if you want to know, I can give you some specifics and we can run to questions because I know we've only got another 15 minutes here, okay? Um, the main arguments or, or the main kind of yeah, arguments that the court utilized in agreeing with the petitioners, okay, was that airborne viruses are not meant to be covered under OSHA's authority. That was the first one. Um, no exposure or no presence of COVID-19 could be found in all covered workplaces, emphasis on all. Mm -hmm. There was no grave danger presented because the disease was not unilaterally deadly. Some people had a mild case, some people had a, had a deadly case. Um, and then generally they talked about this concept that the standard was both over-inclusive and under-inclusive because of this kind of 100 employee um, you know, limitation um, on the one hand, and then uh, so so you know, businesses with 99 or less, you know, didn't have any standard applied to them, um, other than the general duty clause, for example. Um, you know, and and over inclusive, um, you know, because it purported to cover all these businesses that did have 100 or more, um, regardless of of this kind of concept that there was no proof of exposure in the workplace. Uh, very, very, very high level, you know, uh, based on what I saw. So uh, we've got time for questions, which I'm sure is why you really tuned in, not to listen to me just talk. So we can, uh, we can kind of rock and roll with those. Yeah, definitely. Okay, the first came from Corey was asking, um, if the ETS is on hold and will most likely go to the Supreme Court, what is the recommendation for employers and do we start gathering a vaccination status now or is that legal or do we want to wait until everything is settled? Yeah, good, good, look, good question. I think I gave you my general perspective on this, but it is absolutely legal from a fit for duty perspective to ask for vaccina vaccination status today pursuant to a policy that that employer has in place. Okay. Yes, you can ask for that information. Okay. Because, you know, the, the, under the ADA, the fit for duty standard talks about a, a uh, permissible medical inquiry, okay? Job related, consistent with business necessity are the two standards that have to be met to ask for that information. I think I've said previously that the EEOC has chimed in, uh, that business necessity is covered by this kind of information. You're gonna be very well within your rights as an employer to ask for that information now. You know, can you, should you? From a cost, it's just evaluating cost and resource, right? If you've got the ability to do it now with, you know, and, and, and it's reasonably manageable, then rock and roll. If it's going to be a game changer for you from a cost perspective in a negative way, then you got to think through it more more strategically, uh, right? And maybe it's a, it's a defined gap analysis with a, with a, in the event that here's how we would go about gathering the information, storing it, reporting on it, recording, et cetera. Right, because it's not just getting the information. You have to remember it's being able to report on it. You know, record keeping. You got to have a roster. You know, these concepts I think um, you know matter as you consider what to do next. But if you're going to go through the exercise, make sure you've got at a minimum kind of the the idea that you're going to have kind of the record itself that gets stored in that confidential medical file, and then you got to have that roster available too. If you're going to do the work, you may as well do it all at once. I, I think, from my my perspective, um, other than that, gap, gap analysis, like we talked about. Okay, all right. Uh, Diane was asking, does the stay only apply to the states in which the circuit filed? No, the stay by its own terms is directing OSHA to stop all enforcement activity. Period. Okay. And then Thomas was now, asking, does this? Let me, oh, I'm let sorry. Me, there's there's one ancillary okay. to that. One ancillary to that, okay? So if you live in a state like California that has its own, you know, Cal OSHA with its own set of rules, this has no impact on those. Like, you still got to comply with whatever local, you know, state-based OSHA plan documents or procedures that are out there, right? You can't stop doing that stuff. But remember, the ETS is is meant to provide a new minimum standard even in those states that have a state-based plan so for example it's been a while since i looked at cal OSHA's plan i'm sorry but i don't i don't think it had you know kind of this weekly testing requirement maybe i'm wrong um but that would become part of by necessity and by by operation of of law kind of the the state plan 
just bear that in mind, right? You don't get to stop doing everything if you've got a state plan that's saying you're, there's certain things you have to do, right? It's just the federal standard that's we're calling pause or timeout on. Okay. All right, Thomas was asking, does this challenge or the state impact the federal contractor mandate? It doesn't because the federal contractor mandate is under a separate executive order. Okay, so that's kind of, it's two different things, right? Two different pieces of authority that are being um, leveraged in both of those situations. So this does not impact the, the, uh, the, the executive order that mandated all federal employees and contractors to be vaccinated. Okay. With no option for testing, <laughs> ironically. Okay. Yeah. All right. Corey was asking, um, in the meantime, is it legal for the private employer to establish their own policy? And can the private employer enforce testing in a hybrid work scenario? Look, if so, so bear in mind, this is my standard, you know, qualification. I can't give you legal advice. I can give you my opinion based on the limited facts that you presented to me, okay? But as far as that goes, can you create your own policy? Absolutely. You still have a gen the general duty clause is still effective here, okay? And actually having, and I've been an advocate for a policy approach to this for a very long time, having a policy that speaks about hybrid workforce, relative risk presented, and then the ways that you're mitigating that risk by testing, you know, before you have somebody come into the office or testing before they come in for a conference is absolutely okay. Because again, the policy ensures consistency and the ADA fit for duty uh, stuff gives you the ability to run through that process. You make it part of being fit for duty in, in, a, in an office environment, essentially. Okay. Okay, let's see. This one's a little bit more detailed. Um, Richard asked, has there been any feeling or communication about how or when the state operated OSHA programs are going to enforce the ETS or are they going to honor the stay? I think the, I think the states are gonna uh, likely honor the stay because if they were to take action, they would also become potential you know, litigants um, subject to the same kind of procedural remedies on the same basis already argued. So it's it doesn't make practical sense to utilize state money to defend those kinds of cases, I don't think. I would be surprised to see that. Anything's possible, but unlikely, in my opinion. Okay. And then Diane was asking one more question. How should an employer calculate the number of employees? Do you utilize the payroll count, um, KPIs, et cetera? So it, it's a good question that we've heard before. I think that um, what, I, what I would ask you to do is make sure you understand the implications of what's called the joint employer doctrine, okay? It's all about who's exercising authority and control over people that are doing stuff for the business, okay? If you're exercising the requisite control over the people doing the stuff, they will be, as a matter of law, considered employees and they would be counted. Okay. So is payroll a good number to use? Yeah. You know, but it's a little bit more expansive than that. You know, to the if, if you're right at that line and you've got a subsidiary you're trying to like not include, but you've got the same exact team, same board, that's a problem, right? Um, so what I would advise is if, if you're reasonably close or close enough to that 100 threshold and or over it, but you've got this kind of structure, you know, independent contractors, et cetera, talk to a lawyer to understand, you know, how that may play itself out. And then take that risk, eyes wide open. All right. And Blanche should ask, um, we are a multi-state employer with locations employing anywhere from 21 to 55 employees in each city. And she said, they're saying it's a total of 11 locations. We also have truck drivers who leave out for their truck runs as early as 3 a.m. How are we expected to handle testing in this type of scenario as we may only have a handful in each location that would need the testing? 
I mean, it's it's the same logistical challenge that employers are dealing with across the country right now. I, you know, I, I, there are, you can do it yourself where you have kind of the at-home kits uh, that would have to be under the standard proctored or observed or at least, you know, read by someone else within a reasonable amount of time of that shift starting and or them reporting to a location. Um, and then you got to track all that information effectively, right? Um, I mean, Axiom, that's what we do. It's part of the solution that we launched was to provide that service. And it's actually designed to, you know, kind of help people across the country. I, I hate to turn into a marketing spiel, but, um, <laughs> but that's, that's a solution. So what I'm saying is a, another solution is to outsource to a company that is structured to manage that for you. Uh, but again, you got to compare costs. You got to know what it would cost for you to do it internally and then see if you're getting value. And then it's on the vendor okay. to prove value, you know? Yeah. All right. But Susan asked. <laughs> Can be done. Possibly. All right. Susan was, Susan was asking, you stated that we may know something by the January date. Does that mean that the OSHA ETS would go into effect before it is heard? Let me scroll this in before it is heard before the Supreme Court rules on the case. So yes and no. What what I think is going to happen is the stay will be resolved by that January date. Meaning, in my personal opinion, the stay will likely be lifted, and OSHA will begin enforcement activity by that January sixth ish date. Okay? okay. However. This is the difference, right, between the stay and then the case on, on its merits. In the meantime, the consolidated litigation in the Sixth Circuit will move forward where formal arguments will be made about the, you know, all the arguments as to why, why this is an, an overreach of OSHA's authority, why it's not an overreach, why there's not a grave danger, why there is a grave danger. All that stuff will be litigated, okay? And that will also make its way to the Supreme Court. Right, but that's going to take months to ferret itself out. Yeah. Months. Okay. Let's see. Michelle says, um, "Do you think that the mandate will include a cost cap for facilities who provide the weekly testing for the unvaccinated?" Man, that's such a good question. That's, that is I mean, a good one. <laughs> so, so look, I think. I would be surprised if we do not see some form of, I mean, I want to use the word subsidy, but that's probably the wrong word, um, from the federal government related to this, the, the testing cost. Okay. Maybe it's, maybe there's some tax credits involved. Maybe there are subsidies, you know, for certain sizes of employers that are complying, um, I, I would be very surprised to the extent that, that the government believes this is going to become a longer term thing. Um, I mean, we, we've already heard kind of President Biden, you know, originally referenced the fact that they had negotiated at cost kits um, from Walmart, Amazon, et cetera. Um, you know, good luck finding them because the supply chain is dried up. Um, for OTC kits, um, and then you still got to worry about the proctoring piece. But I think that, or the and the the reading. But I think that um, more specifically the reading. But um, I, I I am thinking that there may be some additional um, benefits. Maybe that's the word. I don't know. Relief that we may see from the federal government related to the testing cost because. I mean, it can be substantial depending upon what percentage of your workforce is, you know, vaccine hesitant or anti-vax or, you know, can't do it because of whatever um, medical or religious uh, exemptions, which is a whole other ball of wax. So, so. Chuck, can I give you I one more? Uh, we'll just make... Yeah. I just, just right, for the last one. Exemptions. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so yeah. go ahead. Yeah. 
we'll give you the last one and then then everybody else if we didn't get your question i promise we'll follow up with you individually um okay so carrie Ann was asking if the ets goes into effect and testing is needed can employees be virtually observed for rapid tests by employers to be compliant but safe yeah really good question yes and, and i think it's even it's even more nuanced than that uh, it's even more nuanced than that um so yes thank you perfect all right well guys thank you again i know that we're we're right here at the end of time um but i i do appreciate you joining us again we will follow up with you individually to make sure that you have answers to some of these questions that have been asked they're excellent questions we will do continue to, to provide these um these events where we can get you the um, the latest and greatest of what's going on by our team of experts so thank you for joining us if you haven't already there will be a, a pop-up on your screen that will get you registered for the next event and i hope to see you all there Thank you.